Welcome to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough, slow is fast, and the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to. I'm your host, Tim Reed. Hey, everybody. Thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast. I'm super excited to be here with you today, and it's going to be an awesome conversation. This is one that I've actually been wanting to have for a little while. So Nick Bauer is our guest today, and he owns Empire, which is a you know a, a monster company in our industry. And he's someone that I've gotten to know more recently, but for a long time, just the way that I was brought up in the industry, I just didn't know much about them. And I'm really excited to share our conversation with you because I think that there's a lot of valuable content to take away. In this conversation, what we talk about is what it's like to be working in a family legacy business. And I know that for so many of you listening to this, you're part of a family business. You've got the dynamics of your dad, your mom, your grandma, your sister, your son, your daughter in your company. And I feel like we cannot hit this enough because it's so awesome to hear the dynamic. I think about the conversations that I've had in particular with Grant Falco and Steven Schroeder about these dynamics and How have we been able to take what can be difficult in a family setting, but turn it into a legacy that's powerful and life-giving? And I think that what Nick brings to the table today is really special. In addition to that, one thing that's cool is that Empire's recently made some acquisitions. They purchased Primo very recently, so they're in the grill game. They've got Broilmaster as well. They're in wood now with their work that they've done with SBI. They're in gas, as you probably know them best for, but they're one of the few companies that can be present in every single category of our industry, and this is powerful for them. So I think it's going to be really cool to get to hear about What goes into an acquisition, whether you're a manufacturer, a distributor, or a retailer, if you're going to acquire a company, it takes time and effort. It can't be done just loosey-goosey. I know for me, for years, when I I was kind of coming up through the ranks working for retailers, there would often be talk about, well, we're going to go buy this company, or we're going to go get another store. But the truth is that that takes a lot of time to prepare for. You have to have leadership in place to be able to make this happen smoothly. If you're going to just buy a company, man, if you're not going to bring leadership in, they better have a structure in place that works. And we jump into all that in this conversation. Another thing that we hit that I think is really cool is Nick's leadership and delegation style. So you're going to get to hear him talk about how he trusts and empowers his people. He actually shares a little bit about how one of the hardest things when you come up through the ranks as an owner's kid is that when you become the boss, not everybody wants to tell you the truth. And and sometimes it's, it's easy for people to make things sound good to try to defend their jobs or their positioning when honestly, things aren't going so well. And we jump into all that. I think that the number one thing you're going to take away is that this is someone who's really trying to do things right. He's part of a business that has a tremendous legacy. And even as I did research about Nick kind of getting ready for this interview, what everybody said is that this is a company that does things the right way. They treat you like family. And long-term business is more important than next quarter's results. And I think that that's really, really powerful. So I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I know that when you're done with it, you're going to walk away with a huge appreciation for Empire, for Nick, and all that they're bringing to the table. Joining me from Belleville, Illinois, is the president of The Empire Group. I'm joined today by Nick Bauer. Nick, how you doing, man? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm really excited that you're here, and I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. I was actually thinking about this, and I could be wrong, but I think that we connected close to 10 years ago through the HPBA Young Guns subcommittee. Were you were you a part of that back in the day? Yeah, so the Young Guns was was my idea of you know coming into the in the business fairly young and not really knowing anyone. So I I started the Young Guns. Because the the propane association has a thing called the Young Gassers, so when Empire's been going to the National Propane Convention for I think it was like seventy seven years or something or seventy four I forget how long it is, but they have a they have a convention they have a, a group inside the propane convention that's called the Young Gassers, so that gave me the idea to do something in, in HBA called the Young Guns. So I tried to do that for a few years and. 
Yeah, I remember seeing your name, and it, and it's funny. It, it's all coming full circle now. I know for me at the time, I was an individual salesperson, and I had no idea what the function of any kind of committee was. You know, much less like a young guns committee. So I don't think I brought much value to the equation. But it's cool that we're back here. You know, ten, twelve years later. It basically just turned into a happy hour on Wednesday nights. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And there was an in-person happy hour in Salt Lake City. I, I might have met you in Salt Lake City a decade back or so. We had it our six or seven years, but it was basically was just a happy hour, and that's about as big as it got to. And then I, uh, then I kind of, it just kind of ran out of speed. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to talk about you, Nick, because I mean, even though you've been in it now for ten plus years, you're a young leader that's come up through a legacy family business. I'd love to hear you talk about what that's been like. Yeah. So, and I and I just actually realized this when I looked at the date. Empire was founded in. Uh, August 25th, 1932. So tomorrow will be our 88th anniversary as a business. And it was founded by my great grandfather. So he was a bower. Um, so it's been in the family for, it'll be 88 years tomorrow. Um, so yeah, so it's, it's a, not just one or two generations. I'm, I'm the fourth generation. Um, so the legacy is a, is a very, very important word around empire around my family. Pretty crazy to think about 88 years and, We've been on the same street since 1937. So the office that I go into, the first and and now we have multiple manufacturing facilities, but the first one. So it's been that goes back to we've been we've owned it since 1937. So it's kind of it's really fun to host customers and and people to come visit and see because we have the old and the new. You have the brand new multi million dollar lasers, and you have the machines that we bought used for World War II when we built bomb casing. So you have kind of a combination of of brand new stuff and modern technology and automation and then just the welders from the war. Wow. That's crazy. Well, I want you to talk more about legacy because I mean, I'm, I, as you're saying this, I'm thinking like, Lord willing, man, this is, this thing's going to hit a hundred years under your watch. Like that's crazy. What, 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 what's that mean? What, what kind of weight does that feel like on your shoulders? It's, yeah. So the way, the way I describe having be a fourth generation of a family business is like the greatest opportunity and sometimes the greatest curse because has been given, you know, this tremendous, tremendous history, legacy, um, people, product, story. But then also, you also don't want to be the guy that screws it up. And if, and regardless of, of how successful I am, you're always going to have the haters that say, hey, well, you, this was given to you by your father and your grandfather. So, you know, it's, it's a tremendous opportunity. I, I'm absolutely blessed. There's, there's no doubt in my mind that I was put on the earth to do what I do today. And it, most times it doesn't feel like a job. I will say COVID has felt the most like me actually having a job in the, in the 13, 14 years I've been doing this. So it's just, just you know, I'm blessed. I can say majority of the time it doesn't even feel like work for me. But that legacy is you don't want to, quite frankly, maybe I'm a little too, uh, too half, half, the glass is half full, but I don't want the guy that screws it up. So, and I also, I also don't want the guy passing on to eventually screw it up either because that's truly what legacy is about it not just individual or my generation's success, but make it, make sure the next generations are successful as well, just like the previous gen generations have, have, have set me up for success. So. Oh, that's so good. You know, I was talking recently with someone who works for a kind of a, a legacy type family business and, and his instructions were that your goal is to build the company for our grandchildren. So, you know, he's not thinking one quarter ahead. He's thinking what's going to be the effect 50 years from now, 80 years from now. And that's really cool. Yeah. My grandfather worked at empire for 50 years. So he was the fourth oldest son. So he was never the president. he never ran anything. He worked in the factory. He was a plant manager and he worked there for 50 years of his life. And he's the one who introduced me to the lake, to the, that was his life. That's all he knew. So I've always said, it's my goal to pass it on to my grandkids or, or my sister's kids, kids. Um, so not just that one generation, that definitely that too, because that's just the relationship I had with my grandfather. Yeah, that's special. Well, I want to talk about this. So your company is a really good example of a business that started out as one thing, but evolved over time. And I want to ask you, like, what's been the thought process behind that evolution? Yeah, so, to, 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 you know, you want to be able to describe what you do in one sentence. And, and we provide zone heating solutions. So historically, it's been gas, gas zone heating. So my grandfather, my great grandfather patented the, one of the first gas stoves in 1919 and then built the, the company around it. We were founded as Empire Stove Company in the 1930s. And then we're, we're introducing a new gas stove last week. So here you are, 88 years later, we were founded on gas stoves and we still do gas stoves. 
Um, but they obviously have changed. So it's been that residential zone heating. So whether it be the old four furnaces. So in the 50s and 60s, we weren't really even doing gas stoves. We did 70,000 four furnaces um, per year. We're going to do 300 gas four furnaces this year. So then we got into the vented wall furnaces. And then you got into the hearth products. Um, now you're getting the wood cells and that. But the core of what we do is that residential zone heating. So we're not heating the entire house. We're just heating the room you're in. And as my father likes to say, regardless of what happens, you're always going to need heat. And zone heating is by definition more efficient than heating your, your, whole, your, your whole home when you're only using one room at a time. So those products obviously have changed. And I mean, during the war years, we used to make bombs because we weren't making residential zone heating. So we had to make bombs during the war years in the World War II and then for a career war, Korean war. So, but at the core, what we do is that residential zone heating. Yeah, that, that's amazing. And I know that I want to get to this because you guys have been part of a lot of acquisitions over the years, but can you talk about like, what are, where are all the spaces that you've got companies and products now? So the, obviously Empire Comfort is... Empire Stove changed the name in the 80s, Empire Comfort System. That's out of Belleville, Belleville, Illinois. That's that up until we purchased Stove Builders International out, out, out of Quebec, Empire was, we really hadn't bought anyone. We bought Brawlmaster, just the product line when Martin Stove went bankrupt in the early 2000s. Brawlmaster is another interesting story. It used to be made in East St. Louis, then it was made in Kansas City, then they moved down to Alabama, and then we moved it back to Belleville. So the core, the two big core companies are Empire Comfort and then Stove Builders International. SBI has a couple of facilities. Up in Quebec, Empire. We have two facilities in Belleville. We just built a brand new factory in Missouri um, last August, actually. So there's combined, we got about five or six facilities, about a million square feet. Well, I love this. I mean, you're one of the few companies in the industry that is really active in all spaces. That you're active in, obviously, the fireplace side, wood, gas, pellet, but you're also present in barbecue, and I think that that's an amazing one-two punch because. You know, uh, a few episodes ago, we talked from a marketing perspective that if you're a company that only sells fireplaces, like national branding is super tough because people buy your products maybe once every 20 years, unless they're a contractor, there's very, very little repeat business. And so your, your marketing attacks got to be different, but barbecues are a little bit different than that because when it comes to barbecues, this is something that, that people buy more frequently. It's a social purchase. It's shared with their friends all the time. And I think that's a really unique space that you're in being present in all those categories, especially bringing on something like Primo that was kind of kicked to the curb that could honestly be like a sleeping giant in the industry. Yeah, Primo, when you're looking at, like, when I look to expand and do you expand from within, do you expand from, do you purchase someone, do you owe OEM product out of China? Because quite frankly, you had that chance with Primo. Hey, you didn't need to necessarily buy a brand. You can just get one from a factory overseas. But I look at what's the moat, kind of like what's what makes this different? Like what what makes the position defendable? That's what I mean when a moat. And you had Primo, you had the U.S. based manufacturing. So it's what, it's what Empire does. 98% of the products we sell, we make ourselves. Our, 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 it's, our it's U.S. based. You know, I, like the Iron House doors, we don't make ourselves, but they come out of uh, Montana. So you had the U.S. based manufacturing. You had the oval, the oval design as it compares to the round, which is a patented position. And of his, let's say he had 12 customers in North America, Empire is doing business with about 10 of them already. So it's selling more things to the same people. So as that wholesaler out there, instead of now, they used to have to deal with two companies and now they have to deal with one. With moving Primo into our facility in Missouri, now if you buy a Burrell Master, if you buy a Gas Log, or you buy a Space Heater, or you buy a Primo, you can get it on the same truck. So we're, try we're trying to do more things with the same people as opposed to necessarily add more customers and new channels distribution or, you know, we're not trying to buy something from China and go to Costco, which we don't have the current existing rep for us. We don't have the tech service to support it. So we're trying to do, you know, our customers buy a lot of different things. So how can we make it easier for them on their purchases to con consolidate what they buy to less and less vendors? Because having vendors is expensive. Having your guys get trained with one tech service guy or one sales rep or one customer service rep. So how can you make it as easy for our customers as possible? And that was what really attracted about Primo is most of their customers were current Empire customers. So it was just a nice transition. Oh, it's so good, man. I love it. And you hit the nail on the head right there because you talked about making it easy for your customers. And I think about like what you just described is a total win-win because if you're an existing distributor Adding more vendors adds more complexity and more cost. Purchasers love being able to purchase more things from less people. And especially for you going out and, and you know, 
man, it's so much easier to grow wallet share with an existing customer than to go out and try to acquire a new customer entirely that you don't know if it's going to stick. You have to figure out the relationship. Like that's awesome that you're approaching it that way. And I, and the, our customers sell a lot of different things and very, rarely, rarely would a Kamado style grill ever be the number one seller. So they have to look at it too. And I've talked to a couple of wholesalers that may have dropped frame the last couple of years, but they're coming back on board because they hate, they're like, we just weren't getting the turns that we needed because I had to buy twice a year. But they already get a truck for me a month as it is, so they can just throw it on the truck. So it helps just the math on their side, that freight program, that they, the turns that they look at. And I've, I've joked to the family about this. It's, I'm obviously a genius because I bought SBI coming off of two warm years before two cold years, and I bought Primo before COVID. So obviously I have that crystal ball that I've just timed these two, <laughs> these two deals perfectly. But it very easily could have went the other direction. So having tens of billions of dollars shifted from eating out at restaurants to eating at home has exploded the outdoor industry. So the timing has just been pure luck, but, but it's worked out well. It's taken a lot of that, that family pressure off of myself, that's for sure. Yeah, no, I, I think, well, we'll get here in a minute because I want to talk about preparation in a second. But like businesses have approached COVID in one of two ways. Like the businesses that were prepared financially and, and as far as their leadership structure, their communication, generally they're doing unbelievably well. And for the businesses that weren't prepared, they've been scrambling. They haven't been able to figure out what to do and it's been a nightmare for them. And I think that just, you know, yeah, it could have gone the other way, but it sounds like you were prepared and you knew what you wanted before you went in. We'll get back to our conversation with Nick Bauer in just one minute. Hey, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you've heard us talking about the FireTime Network. And if you have not joined, I'm telling you, you're making a huge mistake. So me and Grant got this idea about a year and a half ago when we were on a plane ride to Minneapolis. We started breaking down the eight different departments of a hearth business and lining out the tools that we've used to be successful in each of them. Well, what that turned into was us brainstorming, how can we get this content out to people that need it and also take the community that the podcast has formed to the next level. Well, that's the Firetime Network. If you go to the firetimenetwork.com, you can sign up totally for free. Now, you do have to fill out a survey that goes over the state of our industry and our expo trade show, but outside of that, I mean, there's no cost to it. Once you're in the Firetime Network, it's like Facebook for the fireplace industry. You can connect with hundreds of professionals from all around North America, get questions answered, figure out what works. We get together for happy hour calls where we talk through the state of our industry. We throw out ideas on things that are working and not working within our businesses so that we can all get better. And we even have a library of content that you can take advantage of right now for free. We've got courses on installation, on sales, on showroom process, on a cadence of meetings. All of it is available. And our goal over the coming years is that that content that we started talking about on the plane ride to Minneapolis will be distributed through the Firetime Network. So if you are not a part of it, you need to take advantage right now. Stop what you're doing and go to thefiretimenetwork.com. You can sign up. It's totally free. And you're going to love the community that you find there. So Nick, where I want to go next is here. You know, we don't know each other super well, but we do have some mutual friends. And I'll, I'll say that some mutual friends that we've had have told me that of, of all the companies they deal with, that, that you're one that really understands family business. Like as, as prep for this conversation, I reached out to some of these acquaintances and I said, hey, talk to me about Nick, talk to me about Empire. What, what do you feel like is their moat, their piece of the value wedge that is unique compared to other companies. And without question or reservation, the answer was they understand family business and they treat us like part of the family. Why has that been so important to you? Well, that kind of goes back to, I think you just mentioned it's the moat. So what makes us different than other people out there that are big companies owned or public traded companies are those other really good family business out there as well. But we position ourselves as you know, if, if you've been, most of the, most of our customers are, they founded the company. So they're their own bosses. They've always been their own bosses. They, they don't want to be told what to do. Um, they, they, they want someone to help them, not tell them how, how to run their companies. But I also position a lot as, you know, it's expensive for us to add new customers. It's expensive for us to train. It's expensive for us to fly burn credits and this and that and put the time and money. So we want to do business people that's going to be there 15, 20, 30 years. So we have conversation up front. Okay, 
we'll call him, we'll call him Jim. Jim, you founded your business 20, 25 years ago. Well, what are you going to do with it in five, 10 years? And we have that succession plan conversation with them in advance. And we we'll, we've been really successful. Jim says, well, my son just started five years ago and I want him to take over the business. And that's when we know we're going to have a good relationship because, because we have those conversations before we become customers. And then, and because we want to do business with people for a very long time. It's just, we don't want to, we don't do a lot of the national home builders that call, call out stuff every year and price and this and that and go back and forth. And it's just, it's just not worth our, our, our effort. Um, so we really position as we want to, we want to do business for a while. And obviously things happen and some, you know, COVID happens and businesses come and go. Um, but, but I also have a philosophy that I, that, that I want to do business with people that I enjoy doing business with. And in my, since 2007, I joke that I've only met two people in this industry that, 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 I, that I didn't like. And thankfully, I have a sales manager that, that can deal with both of them and I don't have to. Um, you know, life's too short. I mean, we, and this is why I get frustrated with some people who, who act like, you know, we, we sell fireplaces for a living. We're not, you're not, we're not curing cancer. We're not going to the moon. I mean, we're selling, a, we're selling fireplaces. So we try not to take ourselves too seriously. Quite frankly, we, we do better do business with people that don't take themselves too seriously too because we want to have fun. A lot of our customers, they have my cell phone. We may talk business once every two or three years because we don't have to. Um, but they know if they ever do need anything, they, they can call that. Uh, but normal is just out to dinner or drinks or, I mean, the amount of text messages I got when, it's, when, it's, when the St. Louis Blues lost to Vancouver a couple of nights ago from, <laughs> from all my Canadian buddies that I've been verbally abusing since the Blues won the Cup a year ago, uh, my phone just blew up. But, like, we're not talking about work. It's just that personal relationship. And to me, to me like I said, life's too short. I, 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 wanted, I want to enjoy what I do and I enjoy what I do. I want to surround myself and, and my employees with people that, are, that feel the same way. I think that's probably what they mean by the family because it becomes like friends because they are friends. And we just have really good people. And maybe we're just lucky. Um, maybe I've found all the awesome people out there, but we just have really good people that we do business with. Yeah, that's so good. I mean, I feel like that's that's one of the things that I've learned. Like, I think that when I was younger, you, you kind of look sometimes at like sales and business as like a negative and I, I felt that way when I first got into the industry. I was an installer. I, I wasn't very sales minded, and and sales kind of felt like a necessary evil, and and that was that. And as I've evolved over the last 10, 15 years, like I've come to such a spot where sales is service, you know. And like, dude, there's people that sell things to me that I love the fact they sell things to me, and it's been so cool as I've been growing my own business with customers that buy things from me. And they're stoked to do it. And I'm excited to be able to provide them a service. I, I think it's what you're describing is really special. And that's cool that you can do that. I like that you also brought up the conversation around succession planning because, man, I mean, our industry is in the next 10 years are going to be super, super interesting. And I want to talk about the idea of acquiring a business. And let's speak first on the manufacturer end. And, and we can we can maybe move in a different direction later. But you've been through multiple acquisitions and whether you're a retailer or a manufacturer or a distributor listening to this, man, if you haven't been part of one, like chances are you could be in the next 10 years. Can you just talk about just the general process of acquiring a business? What, what goes into that? We've acquired two, uh, SBI in November of 2017 and then Primo last November. I've probably talked to 10 or 15, but each one's different. And some of the best deals I've done, I've made offers for and they've been turned down quite frankly. So, and they would have been in hindsight, not the greatest of deals. <laughs> and the two deals I've done, I've gotten really good timing. So there's no perfect formula. Um, it's, it's to me, it goes back to the still about the people It have to be partners that I want to do business with. And, and SBI, we, we were looking at, at SBI, the Mark Antoine and John Francois, the two brothers that basically bought SBI when they were 25, 26 and then had it for 19 years, and then they still own a, a, a minority shake in it, and they're 10 years older than me, um, 19 years older than me, and we're looking around at the wood stove industry, and they had purchased four or five people in 20 years. So they see less and less manufacturers, less and less manufacturers. So they're trying to partner up. So either, quite frankly, either they were going to keep buying other people, and they got a little too big, and there weren't that many other people left to buy, or they were going to get bought, and they were – you know, they look around at the possibilities and they're happy, obviously, to partner with, with us. And now they're selling our gas products under Valve Court that they make in Quebec. Um, so the, the synergies on that deal were just incredible. 
all asset based synergies. I don't I think we laid off one person or something or more of just a U.S. sales force week. You know, it, it's as a French as, as a French company, it's it's a struggle to sell in Texas. It's a struggle to sell in Georgia. Um, just like as my U.S. based rep trying to drive up to Quebec, you know, it's it's just it's it's a struggle. And we can say that that's wrong and it shouldn't be, but that's just reality and you can't fight reality. So it's obviously the math has to work and I'm a math brain. So I do basically 90% of my decisions every day I, I put into math. So I was, I was, I presented to the family and, and we talk about empire internally as a family is, is kind of like the golden goose. We don't want to, we don't want to screw up the golden goose. So any, any decision we do, any deal we do, we need to look at the worst case scenario. So if we spend this money for this and this business goes to zero dollars in a week, what does that mean for us? And we're just not going to risk the golden goose. Uh, SBI was the first time we actually got debt on our business since the early 1990s. And it's half gone now, two and a half years or three years later. So we just, we don't really, we don't operate in debt. That's just not what we do. Um, but we're not going to risk the golden goose. But it's, it, it still comes down to people. And, and quite frankly, Mark Antoine, Jen Francois, my sister says it's the best of the they're the brothers that I always wanted, and they're just really good people. And everyone up in Quebec is just really good people. And I and I miss visiting. I haven't been up there, and since COVID happened, and, and I, it's driving me absolutely crazy. <laughs> That's cool. Well, I want to ask you this then. I mean, I love what you're saying about about lack of debt. I'm really big on lack of debt as well. I think that obviously cash is king, and you've got all kinds of power when you're not in debt. That's really cool. You're, you guys have built your company that way. But I want to ask you, because this is true, again, whether you're a retailer or a manufacturer, I mean, just the truth is in the next 10 years, man, there's going to be consolidation like we've never seen in our industry. And so whether you're a retailer or a manufacturer, if you've put yourself in a good financial position, I want to ask you, what do you have to have in place before going out to acquire a company? Me personally, when I looked at it, like I wasn't going to move to Quebec. I wasn't going to run day to day. So I, I need to have the right, the right team up there who's going to continue to run the day. And that's why it was so, it worked out so well that the, the brothers wanted to stay on. They wanted to continue running the business and, and I'm, and I, I run it by a board. So it all, uh, some people maybe would, would want to go up there and run it. Um, and that's randomly purchase someone that's, that, that you can, you can do whatever you want to do. But me personally, I've, I have a big enough job just in Belleville, running Empire, growing Empire, doing Empire, that I did not want to have to, I needed to have someone else still be responsible for that business. And I'm more of the guy playing chess, more of putting the people in the right positions. I say as president, I should, I should wake up every morning and, and have nothing to do because I have the right people in, 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 their, in, in the right position to actually do, do the day-to-day. -day. Granted, COVID has made things different, but I normally travel 15 to 25 weeks a year. So I don't have a 40-hour week office job because I'm not in the office. And quite frankly, I shouldn't because that means I haven't hired the right people or people aren't doing what they should be doing. Um, I'm not, I'm not a day to day empire guy. I'm more of a, you know, the family aspect, the family business takes a decent amount of my time. And then just more so just making all the different assets are actually moving in the right direction. But leadership, like it's, it's all fun to acquire people. It's all fun to, but who's, who's going to run the business and the knowledge base. And I see a lot of these companies that buy these companies and they wipe out the people that were there and they lose and the knowledge base all goes out the door. You can say what you want to say. Maybe they weren't successful. Maybe they were, but they still made mistakes and you can still learn from the mistakes they made instead of it. But if you throw them out the door, you can't even ask them the question. So financially pre SBI, we were on everything out of a line of credit. So we just took our term debt for SBI and, I, I, want to, I want to go back to what you just said. I think that this is super important, and this is going to be true for retailers as well. When you talk about the fact that, that if you're going to acquire a company, you don't want to have to move to Quebec, but someone's got to run that business. And I think that that's like the number one thing people miss when they acquire companies. And like you said, they clean house leadership wise. Well, man, you better have a leader in place that understands intimately where the business has been and where they're going because otherwise and that you can trust. Yeah. I mean, otherwise you're sunk and yeah. And that you can trust to, to, to tell the truth and not just the good stuff, but the bad stuff as well. And when I say truth is if things are really screwed up and, and I, I never understood, I struggled to being a young leader. I took over as president at like 27, you know, these guys, guys that, that I, that I grew up with, Heck, I'm, I'm, I'm at my clubhouse right now, which is right outside of Belleville. And we used to have these empire parties. So a bunch of these guys, I remember being six, seven years old and us playing in the lake. Well, well now they're my direct reports. And what I didn't understand at such a young age is that they're not going to tell me the truth. Here are guys that I thought were my friends. I thought would tell me the truth. 
but they were almost like afraid to tell me they don't understand something or they don't want to, they don't want to speak up to me. They don't want to tell me the bad stuff. And here I am as a young adult asking them their opinions, thinking they're going to give me their opinion, but they didn't. So that was a hard lesson for me to learn that guys that I respect, I thought respected me and they did wouldn't necessarily tell me the truth because they didn't want to, they didn't want to appear to be like, they didn't know something because I'm 99 percentile to question the status quo. I question everything. And Empire's culture wasn't really like that. I describe Empire culture as a big cruise ship. It's very hard to move, very, very hard to turn. But my personality is just question everything. So the having someone that you can trust to represent your interests is a 100% has to happen. If not, you might as well. Even if, even if it's not what you want to hear at the exactly. time. Exactly. Or you might as well just burn those burn those dollars of bills and, and, and save you the, the lawyer fees. <laughs> That's so good. I mean, that, that leadership principle is unbelievable. I, yeah, it's so good. Who's going to run that company. And what you just said as the leader, man, like this is the truth, man. If you are going to be in charge of everything, you must be in charge of nothing. Truly. I mean, that's, that's the only way that you've got capacity to be looking ahead, to be looking at other ventures. You can't do that if there's a fire you got to put out because there's a customer service issue that no one else but you can handle. You've got to be able to empower other people and and accept their mistakes and failures because that's the trade-off for you being able to run this group of companies. My, my business group says it's best. And and, and I spent a lot of time, business groups, family business stuff, networking, that it's, you have to be able to work on the business, not not in the business because if you're working in the business, you're not working on the business. But then that's that's fine to say as president, but as president, you better make sure you have people that are going to work in the business too, <laughs> else, <laughs> else you're going to have you're going to have issues. And and I've been lucky enough that I have some really good number twos and and, and number three guys that that uh, that 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 report to me. And we've we've been through the trenches together, but we've uh, it's, it's it's all been positive stuff. Sometimes growth is great, but if you can't 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 control growth, it it hurts you just as bad as as loss of sales. And we've been through some years that we couldn't handle the growth that came our way. And that's just as painful and just as expensive as when you lose sales. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And and that's one of the things that I feel like I've learned as I've started to mature more and more is that, you know, growth is something that you've got to control just like, just like your budget, just like everything. I mean, obviously like if you if the market moves your way, you want to make hay while the sun shines. But the truth is that that growing too fast can cripple companies. One hundred percent, and that's how that's how we end up getting a factory down in Missouri. And and I half joke about this, but I really wasn't because we had such growth years that I proposed it, and then no one really no one really called my bluff. So we built a hundred and fifty thousand square foot facility in Belleville. That, I mean, down in Missouri, that we only had like fifteen thousand square feet to move down there. Were what? 13 months into it and now we have half of it filled up already to fill up a half of it about ready to because we have room for another two buildings this size so i joked that the i proposed it and the family didn't call my bluff the next thing i know we're building a factory in missouri so um funny how that works that's great rounding out i want to i want to get personal i want to ask you a couple things here so i want to know this about you personally about nick bauer what's your rhythm for setting up a successful week so when I took over as president, I, I got a coach and unfortunately I lost him two summers ago. Um, but he talked a lot about that, that meeting rhythm. So we do the daily meetings. So we have a pretty, pretty, I will not say strict, pretty established from either the daily meetings to the Friday staff meetings to monthly senior team level meetings to twice a year strategic planning. And then we do monthly CI reviews, continuous improvement reviews with, with all, with all of, of my direct report. So we're of a pretty established meeting rhythm when it comes to that. And then the day, the day can be some days now with COVID and not traveling some days I have, I don't have that much to do tomorrow is a family meeting and then another long meeting. So then tomorrow is going to be the exact opposite of what <laughs> today is. So it's uh, it, it all just depends. Yeah. I love that you talked about the cadence of meetings and accountability. I'm getting ready to fly out to the East Coast here pretty soon to work with some companies out there. And one of the big things that actually Grant Falco is going with me that we're going to be talking about is like the cadence of meetings is something that's got to be in place. You've got to be able to set up week to week for people to know what's going on, be in the loop and have an outlet to be able to problem solve. It's so good. Yeah. With my senior team, I meet with all my reports at least once a month, just on one-on-one. 
And then every Friday at nine, we, re we report out on the week. This is what happened last week. This is what's going to happen next week. Every month we have a longer meeting and this would happen last month. This is what's going to happen next month. And then every six months we do it in April and October, um, getting coming back from a HPA is April and then October is right before the season, basically in the season. This is what we did these last six months. This is what we do the next six months. We don't really go out longer than about 18 months on strategic planning. Just because the world has kind of, and I, and some, and, and some, some of my engineers' brains, I drive them absolutely crazy because they want to go out ten years and yada yada yada. And this is the constant argument we have between a sales brand like mine and, and an engineer brand is I don't want to go out more than eighteen to twenty four months because, quite frankly, the world has changed so much. And these last three or four years, they've seen how fast our world can change. So, and we just had to two weeks ago. So we did some, we did strategic planning again. In we didn't do it in April. We did it in May because of COVID. And we set up the plan. And then as sales have done what they've done this summer, I've had to completely shift like the number three obje objective last week because it just, the world has changed since May. But we have this built into these monthly meetings and we had the conversation. So a fair amount of people have worked on some stuff these last two or three months that we're not going to use right now. So just the, the morale of that could be, could be tough, but having these cadences, having these conversations, explaining the why, this is why we're doing it, these are the goals, this is what we need to do. I got a lot better reaction from the team than I thought I would. Guys who just had to do a fair amount of work, they just realized it didn't quite matter this year anymore. But, but it, it allows you to kind of make those shifts. You know, we were around in third base on finishing one project that I just stopped because the sales are way better than expected. And quite frankly, we're not going to be prepared for the season. We don't start shifting some objectives. It's really good. Nick, I want to ask you this. How do you decide what things are best and therefore demand your focus in the day to day rather than just being swept away on the on the latest whim? Well, some of my guys will probably tell you that I, I get swept away every so often. I, I'm naturally a product guy. So my first job in Empire was, was, was on the product side. In fact, my only other job besides president. So I've always focused more on my time on the sales of customers, the products, the customer visits, the trade shows, the open houses, the, those type of things. So that's still, and that's where I prefer, I'd much rather be in the lab doing a new product development. Like I, I still get to manage one or two new products a year just because I like doing other things besides meetings. So that takes most of my time. And it's just not my, I like to think that when it comes to that type of stuff, I know what I'm talking about when it comes to finance, when it comes to engineering. Um, I'm not subject matter experts there. So you hire subject matter experts to handle those. So I have a CFO. I just got a CFO for the first time a couple of years ago. So basically I try to focus on where I actually have the knowledge, where I can bring the most value. And sometimes it's on the product side. Uh, I didn't know anything about Primo. So I bought a Primo in 2015 when I first started talking to George, the founder of Primo. I didn't cook on it once until COVID happened. So a lot of my time since March has been figuring out Primo. Granted, because I've been stuck at home, but also- Well, I've been seeing on, on Instagram, you're cooking all the time on it. Yeah, now. because I have to, um, and maybe I should have did this before I bought the company last year, but and then I just looked at the math aspect of it. But um, you know, I need to make sure I understand the market, the reasons of this and that. And, they, and they're not always so clear the first week or two. Sometimes it takes six months. Sometimes it takes two years. Sometimes it takes having multiple conversations with multiple different people until something someone said two years ago actually clicks. So that's the way my brain kind of works is, is, oh, that's what he meant when he said that 18 months ago. It, sometimes it just takes a while. And Primo was a thing that, quite frankly, we needed to make successful. And so I, need, I needed to own it. I, I needed to focus on it. So it's just, I don't have this really structured way to do it. It's more just by feel. And quite frankly, fix what, so we have a saying around Empire that says fix, fix what bugs you. So something's not going too well, I, it probably needs to get, get more of my focus. So I'm sorry, so-and-so, if you don't want me asking a lot of questions, then get, get some better numbers. Yeah, I love it, man. That's so good. Last question I want to ask you here. What do you want to be known for when it's all said and done? Yeah, I saw that when you sent that. I was, I was thinking about that. That's a tough question, man. And I, I don't mean to dumb this down too much, but just quite frankly, just being a good person, just, just being a good human. I... Uh, I eventually want to have kids. I, I don't currently. So I'd love to be able to say, you know, be a good father, be a good grandfather. My sister has three kids, so I'm crazy Uncle Nick. So I like to think I'm a pretty good uncle. But, you know, it'd be nice to be known as a good business person, but more so just be a good human. Just you treat people, just treat people with respect and that, that people enjoyed 
you know, my presence. People enjoyed my friendship. People enjoyed knowing me, that I made people's days better. Maybe not every day, because I'm not perfect. I have good days and bad days, just like everyone. Sometimes, I, I promise you, I, I don't make some of my people's lives better some days. But just, just being a human and just being a good human. I love it, man. That's so good. I think you're on your way to doing that. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. I think people are going to get tons of value out of the conversation. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. My pleasure, man. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that conversation with Nick. I know that I got a ton of value out of it personally. And it's so funny just thinking back to how this works. I mean, for me, I'm in my mid-30s and I got into this industry when I was basically like 18, 19 years old. And pretty soon in, like we talked about, I got asked to join this Young Guns Committee. And I'm like, I don't know what that is. I mean, I'm, I'm young and I'm in the hearth industry, so I joined it. But it's funny that years later, there's these people that have become pillars in our industry that were part of that Young Guns Committee. I mean, Nick Bauer's one of them. Rachel Feinstein is one of them. And you never know who the people that you meet are going to turn into years later. So this is another reason why you should always be building bridges and extending the olive branch because it's just amazing to see the growth and development that these people have. Now, wrapping up, I love everything that he talked about regarding family business, just their journey through acquisitions. I mean, I I love his humility to say like, hey, we've gotten this right, but like, We could get it wrong. I mean, there's factors that are outside of our control, but it's so cool that he's been able, especially with SBI, to allow the leadership to stay in place. And they come alongside basically to remove roadblocks and say, how can we help you get better? I think that that's really, really healthy. It's cool to think also how he delegates. You know, if you're a leader and you want to be able to grow your business, the truth is that you can't be a firefighter. I mean, I'm not saying that you're never going to deal with problems. Problems always exist in business and no business is perfect. But if you're so busy putting out fires for your direct reports, you will never be able to grow your business. And it's like driving with your windshield spray painted black. You can't see through it and you're going to run into a tree. At some point you will. What Nick has done is he has empowered the people underneath him. And as a leader, this is single-handedly the most important thing you can do. I mean, truly, if you're a leader, your report card is not about what you can do. It's not. You you know, that was important before you were a leader. Now that you're a leader, your report card is what you can get others to do. And that means that you have to inspire them. You have to give them freedom. You have to give them confidence. You need to remove roadblocks for them. And those are the problems that you solve. Nick has done that and it allows him to actually be running his company and driving it. It allows him to have focus. Like when he wants to spend some time on Primo, he can do that because the other parts of his business aren't going to crumble. This doesn't happen overnight. If you're a retailer listening to this that's just stuck in the weeds, it's going to take time. I mean, realistically, it's probably going to take you a couple years to do it, but it's possible. And even though you think that, well, life could never exist outside of me putting out fire after fire after fire, I'm telling you that it can It absolutely can. And listening to Nick talk about how he runs his company is is something that you need to strive after. You know, I love the question at the end, what does he want to be known for? And, and, And you listen to this, like he's running a huge company, fourth generation family business. At the end of the day, what's it about? Was I good to my people? Was I kind? Was I known as somebody who was nice? Like these are really important things to think about. In today's world, we very often give leaders a pass on personal conduct and behavior. And I'm telling you, the way that you treat others absolutely affects your ability to be a leader. And if you wouldn't accept the way that someone behaves, if they were dating your son or your daughter, don't accept it from them as a leader, period. End of story. There is no justification for that because... Our personal character and habits, I'm telling you, it affects the way that we lead. And just as a society, we're, we're going down a path where we're saying the ends justify the means and the truth is that they don't. So this is where it starts though. It starts with us being people of character and people of kindness. And over time, there's a ripple effect that will change our society. So with that in mind, 
you know, I hope you guys got a ton out of this conversation with Nick. I absolutely loved getting to talk to him. If this podcast has been a blessing for you and you want to support it financially, you can do that by going to the website patreon.com slash it's fire time. That's P A T R E O N dot com slash it's fire time. Whatever amount you want to contribute monthly is absolutely appreciated. Basically, we use these funds to outsource the administrative duties of this podcast so that we can focus on keeping the level of content as high as possible. So with that, I know that there was a ton to think about in this episode. And my hope is that this whole season is making you think about who's the person I'm becoming. What's my legacy going to be? Am I a person of impact? Am I a person of effectiveness? Am I a person of kindness? These are things we got to take really seriously. And I can't wait to see what comes of it down the road. So with that, we're going to end today's episode. As always, I'm thankful that you're listening and I'm excited to talk to you again soon. Thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast. To learn more, visit the website itsfiretime.com. Music from this episode was written and recorded by In Bloom out of Portland, Oregon. We thank you for listening to the Firetime Podcast, where it's never hot enough, slow is fast, and the way to win is to make it so stupidly easy to buy from you that there's no excuse not to. We'll see you next time.